Ross, welcome back to the Diecast. Hello. It's good to be back. So, for those of you that missed Diecast 322, um, which is the last time Ross was on, I'm talking with Ross Zevenhausen, and uh, he was one of the many developers on Watch Dogs Legion. There are so many. Uh, in the show notes, I'm going to have a picture you sent me of the whole of the whole team, and it is crazy. It uh, hundreds yeah, like, of people, right? We we don't At normally get in the same room. Like like sometimes you know like you work with people, you go into offices, but like it's only when they're like, yeah, let's take a team photo that you go in there, and they're like, wow, there are a lot of people, and I'm like a blob in the background. I'm like two pixels tall. <laughs> so Legion was made by a Legion. Yeah, I think it's it's like somewhere in the six six hundred seven hundred people range. Maybe I'm like off by a hundred, but it's a it's a really really big office. That's crazy. Uh, like we were saying before the show, like twenty years ago, it was a big team was considered like over twenty. Oh my goodness, that's a huge team, and it would you know a lot of classic games were like ten people, twelve people. Yeah, you can you can see credits for games that they, they go by in like 10 seconds and you're like, oh, neat. That guy did the programming and that guy was the artist. <laughs> the programming, right. And the, the level designer. Yeah, like I remember uh, Vampire the Masquerade, not Bloodlines, but the one before it, Redemption, I think it was. Um, right, right. I remember like finishing that game and it was like 20 people. And I was like, yeah, they had like two artists. And then I was like, wow, they did a pretty good job. They made like Neverwinter Night style, you know, like a full game. Right, with just those few people, and now it's 700. Yeah, and it's interesting because, like, that, like, it, it seems impossible that so few people can make a game now, but then I, like, I start thinking about it, and it's like, yeah, actually, most of the time spent with a big team isn't really working on the game. It's like organizing people and, you right. know, making sure they're on the right page. Like, they have, like, a lot of throughput, but, like, it's the Titanic metaphor, right? They, well, they ha they can go pretty far once they're aligned, but then everything else is spent maintaining that and getting it in position and actually getting to the work. And it's like 90% of the time, it isn't work. It's like work about work. It's meta work. Right. Making sure your entire army of designers are all artistically on the same page so your buildings match and you don't have like, oh, the color tone yeah. is off on this and the sky. And the scale is just a little off, and or like you didn't for forget to tell like one team that another team is actually building stuff in their in their area, so then they end up like doing something that prevents their team from working, or or they just don't get the memo about something, and they they make content you can't use. It's like it's there's a lot of challenges. Right. One of my theories is that if studios were willing to wait long like okay if it takes two years to develop a game with 700 people if you're willing to wait four years you wouldn't need to cut the team in half you could cut it in less than half because you wouldn't need so much of that coordination if you're yeah. willing to wait yeah four years for a game maybe you could make do with like 200 people yeah, it's it's even it's it's even like in, in terms of the scheduling. Sometimes they bring on people before the game is actually ready for it. So it's like you'll have because of you know all these people, you're like, oh, we need developers working on something. A project will get like 300 people, but the plot won't be nailed down yet. So they're working on like on the assumption that the game will have a plot of a certain type, and who knows how much work gets wasted there, or or how much better right. it could be if it was you know if they just waited until they had. All their ducks in a row before they brought on the team things like that Andromeda had a terrible problem with that where they were just prototyping engines they were trying to figure out how to do like open procedure proc gen open world yeah and, but but you've got this huge team of people that is like okay well how do I design my quest where do the cutscenes go Right. And and they're still figuring out technology. And that went on for like over a year. That's crazy. And how many people yeah. just sat there spinning their wheels, making yeah, stuff. Or, that or how many, like how many people started working on like ideas for quests and things that then they couldn't do because they changed engines or something like that. 
Right. Ugh. It's heartbreaking. Yeah, I've, I've had a few times like that myself, right? I had to work on a project, and they're like, yeah, like, give us a big ambitious pitch or whatever. And it's like, okay, cool. And, you know, that's like three weeks of work or something, you know, and it looks really good. But then they go, yeah, sounds great. But then like a week later, they're like, yeah, we can't do it. Sorry, we'll, uh, we'll have to change something else. And then, you know, like, <laughs> oh. it's like, cool. Man, I was really looking forward to throwing away those weeks of my life. Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's fun to do, but like, you know, I'd like it to amount to something. Right. Well, I've already... <laughs> I've already complained about Watch Dogs Legion, which I feel kind of bad about having you on after I spent 2,000 oh, words fine. bitching about it. Okay, great. I, 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 I was really interested to read that. Um, and it, it's kind of odd that I wrote it that way since, I mean, I really do like the game. Um, I might do a longer form retrospective on it because there's a lot of stuff. I, the Sky, what's her name? Sky, um... Sky Larson? Sky Larson, yeah. I really loved that part of the game. I was great. And there were a lot of moments like that in the game that I really loved. And I would a lot love of mechanics to a game that was like, just, just those moments I'd love. Right. <laughs> well, I want to ask you a whole bunch of things about the development of the game, but I know you were constrained by um, the will of the Ubisoft, so you can't just blabber stuff. So, let's change topics. Yes. Yeah. Maybe once I, I become John Carmack or something, I can... <laughs> You just wander around and say whatever you like and yeah, kind of just say randomly like it. shit talk previous projects. <laughs> right. And if somebody doesn't like it, they can feel free to fire you and figure <laughs> out how to replace you. <laughs> when you're more necessary than any member of man management, that's a good place to be in. That's a pretty good place to be. All right, so but you're done with Legion, or maybe maybe there's some DLC in the works. You probably yeah, can't talk I'm, about that. Yeah, I'm kind that. of in that area now, but I'm, I'm assuming, like, at some point I'll move on to another project uh, in the studio. So what else are you working on these days? Because I know you have indie stuff you're doing. Yes, uh, I'm working on really two things at the moment. I have a mod for Risk of Rain, which is just based on, I played lots of Risk of Rain, and I was like, these things are really annoying to me. Like, it feels like some of this game was designed by not a human being, and uh, it would be very easy to solve if you could just change it. <laughs> and there was like, you know, there was like a modding Discord, and I was like, I wonder how deep you can go into the modding. And I uh, looked it up, and I was like, this seems possible, and it uses Unity. So I figured, why not learn more about Unity and, you know, make a rebalance mod for Risk of Rain? So I did. Very, very cool. Isaac and I are both. Uh, fans of Risk of Rain or Risk of Rain Two. Uh, he's a yeah, fan of both. It's Risk of Rain Two. I'm talking about. Sorry, right. but Risk of Rain One. I, uh, I did play, but that's on Game Maker. Right. Uh, uh, Isaac is a fan of both. We're both a fan of the second one. He's played a lot of the second one and is better than me at it, uh, and has seen a lot more of it. But I I really enjoy it. So I'm curious what parts of it annoy you and you want to change for me it was uh the punishment for taking too long is that enemies get harder to kill which doesn't actually lead into a death spiral it leads into a tedium spiral because it goes from an enemy taking say 10 shots to kill to an enemy taking 200 shots to kill and you don't and that takes you more time which penalizes you more so rather than a traditional death spiral where things get more and more dangerous until you get wiped out by, you know, an enemy attack that missed or you, you're careless and, you know, okay, the punishment's now so high that you die, which is fair, so you stop playing and you reset. It's more like the punishment is you'll be trapped in hell and have to shoot these enemies until the end of days because they'll be gaining strength faster than you can hurt them. And I was like, why would you design a game that way? Why did the enemies get so strong? What, what I decided to change there was the coefficient of the health to damage, so they were still tough, they could kill you quite easily, but the like how quickly enemies died was a lot closer to something that felt good if you were on curve for damage. And like I'm not going to say the mod got it perfect, I let the users actually change it in the mod if they like it or don't like it. It's just one part of it, but uh, that was the biggest thing for me. I was like, I'm so sick of playing with like three or four friends in multiplayer, and 
you know, we're having fun. We're we're a bit slow. We're not playing optimally because we're just, you know, like enjoying the game and, you know, doing what we do, having fun. And then we get to like six levels in and we die not because we are all really dumb, but just because we can't kill enemies fast enough. Like they outscaled us and there's nothing we can do to kill them faster. I'd rather be dead than win. <laughs> right. Like, like death is a better punishment than tedium. Yeah, I can see that. That makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. Uh, was it... Other than sorry, uh, other than that, uh, the the main changes I made were like individual abilities on units. Like the commando, I always found to be very underwhelming. Like not because he didn't do lots of damage per se, but it was more like his shot sounds really boring, and it just kind of is one one shot out of a pistol from your hand that you hold it limply in front of you, or you throw the grenade and it kind of bounces and goes. Pfft. And I was like, I can make that explosion ten times bigger. I can make that shot like you know like. I can throw in three times as many bullets, things like that. Cool. What's it called? What's the mod called? It's Hoppo Rebalance. Um, I'll get a link after, but uh, it's also hosted on my site, I think. And it's Very part cool. of the mod manager. Yeah. Uh, and then just for fun, I, I added an artifact to the game that changes the way weapons drop. So every like every weapon or item drop in the game, rather than you becoming an item golem that's just covered in two hundred items, I was like, what if? as a game mode for as an artifact, you got one third as many items, but the items were three times as powerful. And because I didn't want to rebalance every item with like weird code hacks, I was like, I'll just give you three of the item. So every right. item you get three stacks, but there's there's a third as many in the game. And you only get one guaranteed from the boss and you know and the prices of shops are three times as high. Interesting. So yet yeah, it's sort of means you're going to have more stacked items you're you're, you're never going to have just one just one yeah uh, it's a lot closer to like a classic roguelike where you get the one drop that defines your run and it's like this is really strong rather than becoming kind of every runs the same because you have such a massive number of items that you don't really feel like i'm missing this one or like i have this really important right you kind of get a little of everything in every run so they kind of feel samey yeah, and to shore that up, I also added a bunch of passive buffs that go up when you level. So rather than having to rely on getting movement speed items or health items or damage items, like all that goes up a little bit when you just level up. So you have like a floor that you you're always be competent, but then items matter a lot more when you pick them up. So it's it's more about oh yeah, this is the big ticket item that I. Have. Interesting. So that that's not the only thing you're working on though you've got other projects no, that's, right that's a small project the uh the big project is astral horizon i'm working on a tactics rpg uh which is just built from scratch well it's built on unity but uh you know otherwise built from scratch I, I tried to go in with the the same mentality i think that you did for good robot where it was like i don't want to rely on a whole bunch of different assets from the unity store that would interact in weird ways and have to learn them all and bring in different packages and I was like I'm just I'll just do it from scratch and I'll that way I'll know everything and I'll learn a lot about programming and and how to build the game and you know everything I'll have done will be something I I worked on rather than you know with some exceptions like I don't want to have to write an importing library for for images or you know things like that so uh Astral Horizon it's a kind of an XCOMy type thing yeah, it's a bit like if you crossed XCOM with um, Into the Breach uh, and a bit of Fire Emblem too. It's like you control, I'll say, six units average. Um, they have like three or four abilities each. Uh, they're like unique characters. They're not like randomly generated XCOM dude A. They're they're more like a specific character that has like a narrative to it. And you could find more through the story. And you know, maybe there's optional quests where you encounter one, like a a little bit like a Mass Effect premise there. You have like a ship, and you know you you gain allies as you play. Interesting. Yeah, and the actual gameplay is a lot more like uh, sort of like XCOM. It's like units can shoot in a straight line uh, for the most part. It goes like a certain number of cells forwards, um, and then you know how you position them, how they interact. Uh, you know, how, like how you anticipate the way the enemy will act probably be a, play a big role as well. So would you say you're still in the prototyping stage, or are you like really into into the work at this point? It's sort of uneven. I have I'm like I have a combat engine that's pretty far along. Um, I'm still working out like a few details, like like uh, the saving loading, the 
um, like the animation system because I wanted to do like animation sequences. I just want an AI to to shoot a bullet and then a damage to pop up every single time. I might want one where they jump backwards, you know, like shoot ten times. The damage gets divided in ten for the numbers that pop up, and you know, plays a sound effect and a particle effect and all those things. I'm still working on those little bits of details, but uh, like the game design is pretty locked down. It'll only change if the play tests end up, you know, like this game plays weird or you know whatever, and then I may, might think right. it through a bit more. Yeah, uh, I've also been prototyping it in Roll Twenty, which is really interesting because uh, you, you know what Roll Twenty is, right? I, th I think that was in a previous diecast. Um, I've forgotten, so you better tell me again. Roll Twenty is like a tabletop uh, emulator. Almost, it's uh, it's what people play Pathfinder and uh, like other tabletop games online with, but it has a macro system that can like use variables that you set in character sheets. And I was like, I could prototype my video game's combat in this without actually having to have you know multiplayer in my video game yet. So then we'll see how it plays with multiple people. So I'm do I'm using that to do it, and it's working out pretty well. Nice. So that's a pretty broad range of. You've got a little of everything. You're working on AAA game, you've got a full indie game, and then you've got a mod. <laughs> so you are yep. <laughs> across the entire spectrum. Yep, that, that, of scale. that pretty much sums it up. Because it's like, you know, That's AAA cool. video game's great, um, but then, you know, sometimes you're like, I want to work on something that I, you know, I had the idea from start to finish, right? So let's just make a game. And I know that sounds like a crazy idea for someone who's probably busy every day, but you know, it's a it's a fun hobby. Sure. And you said that your your job at Ubisoft isn't a meat grinder that squeezes you just you know, no, it's sixteen it's hour days. Nice. Yeah. yeah, it's like I'll clock so, in and I'll have an eight to nine hour day, right? Uh, you know, and then I won't have any any necessary pressure to crunch except like. You know, if there's like a deadline and it's like, well, yeah, well, this will get bumped to a previous thing or cut if it's not done. Yeah, there's like usually, you know, a week or something like that where everyone's scrambling to get things in on time and make sure everything's perfect. But I think that's pretty much unavoidable in, in software development, right? Sure, sure. It's not like oppressive crunch. Right, that's just normal. I mean, any, any vocation that is project-based is gonna have that you you can't avoid it yeah <laughs> work does not come in perfectly even measured chunks and deadlines happen yeah and you know sometimes it's just the other way around and things are kind of light and we're waiting for you know to find out what we're doing next and stuff like that so it, it kind of balances out too sure but that leaves you with enough time for these hobby hobby projects and that's really cool yeah. Yeah, actually, working from but, home has been great for that because it's like two hours free every day, right? Anytime I would be in transit, I can now just be at home. Right, but yeah, <laughs> that's that's a big part of of why I haven't like gone out and sought a job, even though programming yeah. jobs pay a lot more than complaining oh, about things on the internet. It's the biggest drag because it's like, imagine you finish your job and you're like, great, okay, I've done my work. Now I can do stuff for me, and then you realize. No wait, I need to sit in the box for an hour and do nothing until I'm able to do right. that again. Right. And even once you I've found even once you get home, there's sort of a necessary decompression time. Yeah. There's like, like I on top of having to address your basic needs, like eat. <laughs> right, but you know, I'd spend when I was at Active Worlds going into the office every day, I'd spend all day thinking about the project I was working on at home. But once I got home, I wasn't ready to just like, and my commute was only 10 minutes, so. Oh, that's such a good commute. Right. Um, so I just drive home, but even then, I wasn't ready to just sit down in front of the computer and go at it. I needed like. Yeah, it's, it's like also because some like, television or be something. sitting there. Right, exactly. You, you want to sit down and like watch a thing and just like decompress and eat food and you know not be immediately be right. working again right but you know that i don't have that problem when i work from home like okay i'm working on my programming project i'm done with that time to get some writing done for them for the blog just yeah. instant transition i don't need to like 
oh, I have to relax after sitting here. There, there's no there's All that no strenuous cost. sitting. Right? There's no cost. I, I think for me, being an introvert, I think uh, the it's very draining being in an office and answering the phone and, you know, meetings and talking with people and and all of that. Yeah. I, oh, I have I some great, to... like, office gripe stories. Like, uh, I would, I had a desk at one point that was in the corner of, like, a like a cross-section where people would walk. So, like, the, the washrooms were on one side, the, the main... Uh, the, if you haven't seen the office, it's basically a big factory that has like a walkthrough, you know, in the middle. So if you want to go anywhere, all the desks are like nestled off to the sides and there's like a big footpath right down the middle. And I was right up against that. And I had people literally going both ways constantly. And like the floor was like, I wouldn't say squeaky. It would rumble when people would walk past. They had like a, like a reverberation to it. So I was constantly going up and down. As, as like oh. hordes of people went by me and I was like, get me out of here. This, this isn't uh -huh, Ubisoft you're talking about. This is a different job, right? Oh, this was Ubisoft. This was just one of my, my worst desk positions. Like they moved me after that into a corner when the, you know, like teams changed or whatever. And I was like, keep me in the corner. This is way better. Right. Interesting. The pictures uh, that you've sent all just made it feel like the offices were really nice. They're like they're they're nice, but they're um, like uh, Toronto is based on an old. Uh, I think it was a sock factory, so they just cleaned the space up. They added a whole bunch of like like desks, and it's an open concept thing. So of course it's kind of loud, um, and it's an old building. It looks really nice, like you know, inter if you like old like infrastructure, it's pretty cool looking. But um, it's still under construction in parts too. They're they're like adding new new wings and like a cafe and things like that. Um, so the, if you if you look at the team photo there, that's like the ground floor that was just renovated. So you can see all these like exposed wooden pillars and like nothing else down there. It's a giant concrete floor and a massive space, stuff like that. Huh. Yeah, it's like the workstations are reasonably comfy. It's just like you know if you have five hundred people on the floor and they're they're constantly moving around to get drinks or go to the you know the cafeteria sure. or, two or something like that is there's always people going by so getting the aisle seat is like really uncomfortable sometimes it's like an airplane oh that's that sounds bad <laughs> that's a bit harsh um before the show you talked about an in a mailbag question you wanted to revisit that we didn't cover while you were on the show um and the what was the topic of it? How the more sort of the higher fidelity assets you have, the more it constrains you for what you can do. Yeah, it was really interesting to me because um, that's something I, I've pretty much felt like while working on all these mods and games and things is really the more detail we put into environments, especially. Um, like I'm sure it also applies to things like story and voice acting and stuff like that. But like being being level guy, it's most obvious to me in environments. The more detail you put in an environment, the harder it is to kind of experiment with it. And, and it really it really follows like a curve. So it's like if you go all the way back, you know, it's like Wolfenstein and Doom. Like they're limited by technology. You know, you have rooms. I don't think you could have rooms atop of rooms. You know, it was just like a maze. Right, right. 2D yeah. overhead and, maze based on right. a fixed grid. Yeah, and, you know, like... The, the maximum size was probably limited by like available memory, uh, like the hardware. And that like rapidly expanded. And we got games like Half-Life or uh, like Thief, you know, where suddenly you could make levels any size you wanted. And there was like a push in like Duke Nukem 3D and things like that to make spaces that kind of felt more real. They weren't just like box rooms or like weird shapes. They were like, oh yeah, you're in the cafeteria, you know, you're in the warehouse. Here's some warehouse stuff. Here's like forklift. Right. Um, and then it got to like an incredibly large degree. Like it, like Thief has levels that are like inadvisably large, like uh, like the Thief Guild, where it's like this place is so big that you can get lost fractally. You can get lost in this area and be like, oh, I found my way out, and then not know where you are inside the larger map. <laughs> right. Oh, the yeah. Thief levels are brutal. A few of them, yeah, the really big ones could really get out of hand quickly. That was not a game that you wanted to play in short chunks like yeah you definitely it, it was like didn't want... 
give it like three hours for a mission, that'll probably be enough. Right, but you definitely didn't want to play halfway through and then walk away from the game until tomorrow. Oh, because God, when you no. come back, <laughs> when you come back, you are hopelessly lost. You've got no like, idea. Right. I feel like the Thieves Guild is like purgatory because you you mention that to people and then you remind them, by the way, it's mostly a suit. And they're like, oh, no. Right. You you but, pick yeah. a you come back to the game later and you explore and you're exploring you're not really finding anything and then you find a pile of unconscious bodies and you realize you've been backtracking for the last five minutes right and and like not to like go off on a tangent but like this was before um the like the the signposting binge that games have been on where it's like go exactly here and here's where you you know here's the path you have to follow to get there it was thief was just like go to the refectory and you're like what's a refectory and how do i get there and it didn't have any other clues than that right and there was there was a certain charm to that but it definitely yeah, right but it definitely sometimes got a little out of hand yeah well it's it's it goes both ways like cuz like old games sometimes you just get lost and that wasn't great but sometimes you'd be able to work out where you were from like context clues like oh yeah it's the kitchen so the kitchen is probably on the first floor you know near the dormitories or whatever and it would be there it's like in thief because they had smart level design and it was great i love doing right. that but uh you know on the other hand you know they occasionally get lost but these days it's more like uh i've had i've had bugs sent that were like i didn't have an objective for five seconds it was like an objective ended and then i waited five seconds for something else to happen and i got a bug from uh like you know the qc uh, the testers that was like i didn't know what to do for five seconds uh could you could you give me an objective <laughs> for those five seconds <laughs> can you tell me to wait and i was like oh god i'm dying inside i guess i will right i guess you have to do that it it was literally like it was like a wait between two things and i, I was they were they were like unsure what to do briefly i wonder like that's and not to complain about that specific person. I mean, that's what the market seems to want right now, is incredibly guided experiences. Yeah, I think I think also part of that is probably the size of, of uh, testing now. Like, like, testing is a big deal, which means that if anyone has a problem, it'll probably get flagged as a problem, which means it's more likely that someone will try to fix it rather than shut it down is not a problem, I guess. Right. And, but I wonder, there were an entire generation of gamers that never had that thief experience of like, where do I go? I, I, I where am I? I open up right. the map and it doesn't tell me where I am right now. Right. It's, it's just like maybe shaded or, or nothing. It's just a picture of, of the place. And you're like, well, that's a, that's a landmark. I can figure out where I am. Right. And how many of this current generation of gamers if you put them into Thief? That's a really good question. Right. Like, how many... Now, of course, a lot of them are going to be put off by, like, people with, you know... Yeah, 100 polygon five, humans. Right. You get five polygons on your face and mitten hands that... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> origami people. Origami men. And, um, and they probably will find that off-putting, but if you, like, gave them the thief experience, how many of them would be like, you know, I, 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 this is growing on me, or this is interesting, or, oh, the sensation of not know, of not immediately being shoved to the next thing is, is interesting. Yeah, it's... Like, I've gone back and played old games, and certain bad games actually taught me more about what, like, good game... What game design is, not even what good game design is. Like, because they're bad and broken in ways that nobody would normally consider, you you end up with, like, feelings and moments where you're like, oh yeah, no game does this, and this isn't this isn't bad, you know? Like, there's something I could, I could take here and learn from. But yeah, uh, things are very signposted, and but getting back to what I was talking about before, though, is like that was like the apex of technology in terms of you could just pretty much make whatever size level you wanted. And if you wanted 
to add detail to it, the level designer would do that. They'd usually take, they call them BSP shapes. You, you take like big chunky blocks and you'd build like a dresser or you'd build like a subway entrance or something like that. And then you'd get a texture for right. it and it wasn't a big deal. It was like a photo source texture. Someone took a picture of a size subway train and slapped it on the side of your, your block. And then that was acceptable as a subway, you know, it may not be look <laughs> great, you know, but right. it was good enough. It's opaque. But then it has these opaque windows, and it's fine. Right. Whatever. And it's it's got a reflection of a guy holding a camera in the uh, in the window. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> like, I'm pretty sure all of Max Payne was that. It was just like someone with a camera taking like okay digital pictures of uh of like seats and walls and like people's faces and and just pasting it all over the uh, the models. It's called photo sourcing. It's like when you. I mean, I guess many textures are photo source. It's when you don't do any treatment to them. It's just like, oh yeah, that's a wall. It's just going on my wall model now. It's going to have the lighting baked in. It'll be fine. We did that at Active Worlds back in like 1999. We had a really early digital camera. That thing must have cost a fortune. But it was like, hey, oh, I need. Cool. Yeah, I, it was like, oh man, I need like, I need a sidewalk texture. So you just walk outside and take a picture of the sidewalk and we would have to do a little bit of extra work to make it tile you know yeah that's that's what i but, did for uh most of my firearm source levels i would i had a texture library of just me going out and taking pictures of stuff and getting weird looks from people as i like take in-depth photos of the ground or the sea <laughs> right it was kind of funny we were outside the office building like taking picture of a drainage grate in the parking lot right trying to trying to get exactly above it so it's nice and square and you know somebody comes out like what are you doing i yeah i i at one point was i was downtown near a university standing on a bench like like crouching like there's the perfect angle that i can get these lines like parallel <laughs> people are like what are you doing <laughs> right but yeah uh, like that went away around the same time as we started getting like 3d model details on in levels that weren't just like the environment so uh like call of duty probably is like the best example of that where everything is high budget everything is detailed but it's a corridor it's literally a straight line there's not really a level there it's it's just like a path right it it bends around but not even enough to hide the fact that it's a path yeah it it, it it's not like it's a straight line but it's like, all the detail around you is the only thing that exists in the world, and you can't really leave that place. Uh, and it's, you know, all, doors are locked. I think that's probably the thing gamers notice most. It was like, there are lots of doors in this game, but none of them open. Or NPCs open them for me so we can load the next area. Right. And I miss the half... I mean, that's more and more common these days, and I miss the Half-Life. Half-Life was really good at disguising that. Yeah. And, you know, they had the power to, to like, flesh out what was behind a door if they really wanted to. Uh, even Half-Life 2 did a pretty good job, I think. Right, right. Half-Life 2 is the one I was really thinking of where I'd be like, oh, which way do I go? Okay, I'll go this way. And you go down the hallway. Oh, which way do I go? I'll go this way. And every, t every time you think you're making these choices, but then the second time through the game, I'm like, I'll go the other way. Oh, wait, it's just a dead end room. It just loops back, yeah. <laughs> Right. But oh like, yeah. yeah. It loops it loops back and then drops down into the into the first way. Right, but it but it feels like an open space. Right. It makes you feel like you're making decisions and it makes it feel more open without you ever like wandering off and having that thief feeling of like, where the hell am I? Right. Where am I going? And that's like that's like a really big difference in modding because uh for Half Life you could you could be one guy and you could make a whole level. And it was sufficient, you know? You could make a great level if you were playing, like, Doom. You could beat the developers at it. But if you were in, like, Half-Life yeah. 2, you suddenly needed to know how to 3D model, unwrap, and texture your own props and export them to the engine um, to be able to to kind of make a level on par with Half-Life 2. And that's that was a Oof. big, big gap for a lot of people. Like, they, they couldn't really cross. And they kind of just dropped out of level designing for shooters. Right. It, you kind of needed a team from that point on, which is like I think a lot of reason why mods have mostly died out these days. Like com combined with a good reason, which is that stuff like Unity exists now. So it's like 
yeah, you could make a full conversion model as passion and, and detail put into stuff and work with a team of people to make something that will never make you any money or, or fame. Um, I have like, lots of stories about that. Uh, or you could make your own game and sell it for money and get all the same benefits for free. Right. And just use Unreal or, or Unity or something. Well, that brings me to the other thing. I, want, I, I should have had, talked about this earlier in the show, but talking about your past projects, the other stuff you've worked on, the most obvious for me being the game we worked on together, which was Good Robot. Oh, yeah, that was fun. That was fun. That was a fun project. Uh, every once in a while, I think, oh, that was so fun. And I, like... That's actually, I think, one of my favorite things to do as a developer. It's, it's when someone has a system and they hand me a whole bunch of variables, like, here's how fast bullets move, and you know, here's how much damage they do, and it's a big spreadsheet of values, and they haven't really thought through what they're doing with it, or they've they've have been following like a game design document and they've just done exactly like the three things the designer asked for, and I'm like, what if? I was to do something right. crazy with just these numbers, how would it feel? And I'll do a few prototypes and test it out and end up with something that's like surprisingly fun or weird or interesting. And then I'll like pitch it to them like, yeah, like, look at this. Isn't it fun? You know, maybe if we had got like 5% more or something, we could make like a new archetype of enemy or something like that. Yeah. And my, the thing I love doing is making those kinds of systems. I don't know if this will be useful, but it's a fun idea. What if what if bullets could bounce? I'll just throw in right. a switch. I, don't, I have no idea if that'll ever be useful or make sense in the game, but I'll throw it in there and see what happens. And I'd throw in a bunch of switches of weird things you could do with bullets. And that was a lot of, and then I'd saw, oh, wow, look at all these possibilities that emerged from it that never would have occurred to me. So I think that was a, a we had a symbiosis going there. Yeah, I, I, I thought like a lot of the tests there were really fun. I also remember stuff like uh, missiles that could lock onto the player by accident and things like that, where I was like, wait, it's homing on me. <laughs> it was my own missile. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right, I forgot that was a thing that could happen. There's some great, Did, some great bugs like that. So I made missiles that homed in on the... Yeah! My first homing missiles were designed to be used against the player. And so then, just naturally, you had the ability to turn that on. And you decided right. to give the player homing missiles, but I hadn't coded... A missile that would home in on robots. I, I, I never noticed that, that it was like it I think it did home in on, on other stuff, but I never noticed it was homing in on me until I made one that bounced and I noticed it, it bounced off the wall and then it, like tracked me and I was like, oh no. <laughs> I wanted this to be lethal to the enemy, but this is hyper lethal to me. I was just before we came in here I was playing Noita. And that's another game that feels like they just had Oh yeah. Uh, just a billion options for what projectiles can do. Oh, this one will go a distance and then create another completely different projectile that launches right. on, along the same trajectory. And not only did that give, you know, whoever was doing your job on that team a lot of freedom, but then it even gives some of that freedom to the player to craft some of their yeah. own weapons. That was crazy. Yeah, I, as I just not to go back to the previous topic, but uh, that's something I built into Astral Horizon as well. Uh, I mentioned units have their own abilities, but I I didn't just give them an ability each. I gave them like a system of interacting like little little mini parts of an ability that you could assemble abilities from. So. I, I specifically built it so I could come up with crazy ideas and put them on different units. So things like explosions don't just do damage in an area, they shoot out ray trace lines, which can be blocked by units. So if a unit has like a shield and an explosion goes off in front of them, they actually block the area behind them so it's safe for allies and things like that. Oh yeah, interesting. Yeah, so it's like an interaction chain, right? Where sometimes I won't even know what's possible with it until I experiment, but I'm like building little bits and pieces and tools. It's pretty fun. That is fun. But uh, aside from Good Robot, what are some of your other past projects that you've worked on? Uh, I I started with mods for Star Siege Tribes, which is, um, those were all in C++, or technically they're in Dark Star, but that was just, C++ is our scripting engine, the uh, the engine. And uh, 
it it was super interesting because I don't think I've ever seen a game do this before. You'd write scripts that controlled the gameplay logic. So, you know, how you win the game, like damage of bullets, behavior of bullets, uh, movement of players, all those things were variables that were part of the scripting engine. And you could inject your own code and change those uh, without changing like major parts of how the game played. And it let you basically right, make any right. game you wanted using this game. And the only limitation was you couldn't use your own models or textures or, or stuff like that. You could make your own maps because those are also just a script. But when you made that, other players did not have to go to a website to download it to play your game. You just had to host a server and they would join it and suddenly they'd be playing Tribes Football or Tribes the Strategy <laughs> Game. Tribes Football. They, you know, yeah. It was actually a thing. Tribes Football was a thing. That's some pretty impressive... Uh... Yeah, uh, you'd, you'd like, like to lean back and, and huck an ammo box that was actually that was supposed to be the football at a player who'd then jump and catch it and have to run to the end zone. Oh, that's amazing. I should see if I can yeah, find that um, on YouTube. Uh, it's like me, me and my friends, we made so many crazy things with that. We did tower defense. We did uh, a, a strategy um, uh, FPS, like a natural selection. You could build bases and turrets and AI and things like that. Um, and this like tribes is a is like a shooter. It's like a quake style shooter where you move really fast and can jetpack in the air. But uh, you could make whatever. A, a friend of mine actually made a a procedural uh, spaceship maze thing that was literally like Warframe before Warframe. It was just like uh, modular rooms that connected to each other. So when you went to a door, it would generate a new one. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, that was all what, programming, what? and it was super fun. What? When was Star Siege Tribes? That was like early aughts, right? Yeah, it was. I think it was 1999 when the game came out, but I, I didn't play it until like 2001 or two. And then when I was in high school, uh, I was like, "You can make mods for this. That's really cool." And actually, that's why I became a level designer because uh, to you, it wasn't that you couldn't make props; it was that no one really did. And you, you made props using a BSP shape editor, which. Uh, I don't know if anyone's familiar with this, but that's what you use to make levels in Half-Life. So I was like, I want to right? make a base. So to do that, I have to learn Worldcraft or Hammer Editor, which is what it's called now. And I ended up just becoming a Half-Life and Half-Life 2 level designer because I learned that. And I found it more fun than continuing to make Tribes mods. Like I, I, I had you know, done so many Tribes mods, I was like, this is more interesting to me now. So I ended up doing that. All right. Um... Any other projects you think are worth bringing up now? Because I know you have quite a few. We don't have to go over them yeah, all. Yeah, so many. Uh, just to go through them quickly, I worked on Firearm Source. That was a big, big one. Um, that's also where I met Arvin from Pyrodactyl. Not, not working for Firearm Source. He was a dystopia programmer. Um, so we were both like, oh yeah, like Half-Life 2 modding community to represent, <laughs> you know, when I, when I first met him. I didn't know it at the time, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, Firearm Source was uh, like there's Firearm was a Half Life mod. Firearm Source was the source remake of it. It went through a lot of development. Uh, I wouldn't say struggles. There were like five Firearms teams at one point with various differences, but uh, we ended up making a pretty good game. It was like like, like Counter Strike Source, but more detailed. Yeah, it was also I think the game that uh, set the foundation for Battlefield because uh, Battlefield's ticket system and like parachutes and whatever all came from a developer that they recruited from. Uh, the original firearms team. I did not know that. I did not know that um, Battlefield had that lineage. That's weird. Yeah, it, like the original Battlefield was kind of uh, like the, the legacy of original firearms, even though the fans of firearms stayed behind to make all these mods. And uh, for that, I, I modeled weapons. Um, I made a few levels, although I didn't think any of them made it to release. Uh, I did a lot of tech stuff there. And a lot of game design. Um, then I joined Pyrodactyl. That's with all the uh, the Pyrodactyl games we made. So Unrest, uh, We'll Fight for Food. Those two were really fun to work on. Unrest is basically like an adventure game RPG. Uh, I loved with... We'll Fight for Food. I just oh that god, game that was, was really super fun charming. I I only worked on the remake for that. Uh, like Ian was the scripter from the for the very old original version that they. It was from before I worked at the company. But then when we did the remake. I got to go through all the old like dialogue and situations, and it was like really fun. Also, really jank. Um, I had I did not have a what's it an IDE uh, 
or any other kind of programming tools, I wrote that in Notepad. Oh, old school hardcore. Yeah, uh, it was it was all in Notepad. It was uh, it was what is it? Uh, XML scripts for everything, and it was an older version of the engine than Unrest, so it was even less featured. And I was like, oh god, how am I going to do anything? I had like a document that was dedicated just to untangling like weird logic and strangely named variables and stuff like that. And I was like, what does this even do? I've been using IDEs since 1990. <laughs> so yeah. you you programming in 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 text files with a text editor in what was this like 2010? Yeah, something like that. That's crazy. And uh, yeah, to... like yeah. So go, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say the text editor. Um, I also did it on the same laptop, and uh, that was that was for my story where I was up north and in the middle of the woods, uh, trying to finish a chapter of unrest on this laptop, writing that text editor. <laughs> Amazing. Just going with battery power. It was great. All right. Um, to wrap things up, I. You haven't mentioned to me any future projects that you want to do. I think Astral Horizon is is occupying your time, but do you have any future projects yeah. that you're like, I'd like to work on this someday? I have a big a big list of like game ideas for once I've done Astral Horizon that I'm just kind of like, you know, as I'll as I'll get a cool idea while I'm working on something for a plot or for like a, a game mechanic, I'll go, ooh, that sounds good, and I'll just put it in the in the list and kind of those are like congregate into ideas that could be future games but the two the two big ones probably i want to make a mech game mainly because i love mech warrior like classic mech warrior the big map the objectives you get uh the mechs are always kind of a bit slow on the other hand you can play games like armored core you know there's there's a genre of like really fast mech games but i always feel like they're too fast and not skill based enough i want them to be more like tribes so i was like that sounds a good idea i could probably make a co-op single player versus enemies you control big mechs game you know like real time one, yeah, real time one. It, like, say three to two to four players, uh, you get a mission objective or even single player, and it's like, it's a big map where you have like a like in old mech warrior games, you know, destroy this base, then you'll get like an airdrop of enemies that surround you as part of the plot, and then you know like save this hostage from somewhere or something like that. Like, a mission that proceeds over a big space, and you can use your mech in all kinds of fun ways, and that you also have to actually aim at your enemies. So it was my big contention with like armored core and things is it automatically aims for you and i was like i like in tribes when you could track an enemy and shoot a disc at them in you know in like three axes and try to hit them with that flying disc because it felt super rewarding when it actually worked yeah so i guess you need to just keep learning unity because yep. <laughs> that's a big project yeah, uh, like Astro Horizon is an enormous project, but I'm hoping, you know, I can get it done to a level where I can pitch it and then uh, get either, either kickstarting or some kind of backer and then bring on an artist. I have like an artist in mind and, you know, find other people. It shouldn't need a big team, I don't think. It's just going to be slow to, to come out, you know. I'd, I'd like to make a game something like, uh, I don't know, like Bastion or Transistor or something like that with a small team, which sounds crazy, but, you know. That kind of ambition would be great, um, and who knows? Uh, but other than that, like in the future, I've also wanted to write a thing. Uh, I've never written a novel before, but I've always wanted to write like a, a modern day supernatural kind of mystery story. All right. Well, I, I'm just I. You never mentioned being married, so I'm just gonna go out and on a limb and assume I you don't not. have a family. No, I would not have the time. Right. To work on any of these just, things if I did. Yeah. I'm deeply envious of the time you have. I mean, I love my family and all, but yeah. I was like, wait, how are you going to do all this in one lifetime? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, just I work on stuff when I can, I guess. It's, it's nice to have the time, but also, you know, it's got its drawbacks too. Sure. Well, this was a very fun conversation. Thank you so much for coming on, Ross. I don't mention it. It was super fun. Um, To... To anyone listening to the show, hopefully, hopefully, uh, lots of people. This was a great conversation. Um, I, if you're curious about any of this, I'm going to have links to as much as possible on Ross's site, so you can check out these projects and things. 
Um, if you've got a question for the show, obviously we didn't do a mailbag this week, but if you've got a question for the show for when Paul comes back, the email is diecast at SeamusYoung.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. Say goodbye, Ross. Bye, everyone.